cruising across the open countryside south of Alice Springs. But today is a good day in the life of the Gen. It was special because it was named after three old Afghans that were in Udnadatta when the line was only at Udnadatta and these three old Afghans were the only three passengers. And I got down to Coward Springs, they pulled out their mats, they prayed the train out of wait for them and when they finished their prayer and everything, the train went on again. And that's how the GAN got its name in the first place. Ghul Muhammad's version of how the GAN was named is one of many. Others say there was only one Afghan involved in last minute prayers. But whatever the embellishment, the common denominators are always the Afghans, who in the middle of last century brought camels to Australia to help in development of the Overland Telegraph, and subsequently the building of the Central Australia Railway Line, which carried this train to the red centre of Australia. On the Gan, if you want to see the land, ride the Gan. Oh, it's the magic boomerang. The wonder never makes it back again. It's some compensation for those people who care, I suppose, that the Monday morning train from Adelaide to Port Pirie nearly always leaves on time. Compensation because further north, it's almost certain we'll fall behind schedule considerably. That's the way it is. Of course, this section of the trip can only be loosely regarded as the GAN. From here to Port Pirie, it's broad gauge, then from Port Pirie to Maree, it's the standard gauge line, and finally from Mari to Alice Springs is what the old timers call the real gan, the narrow gauge, and that's when the fun begins. And that's why they call it an unfolding adventure. Thirty minutes from the city and just past the outskirts of Adelaide's northern suburbs. Yet even if this isn't the official GAN, merely the name of our first stop, Two Wells, already oozes connotations of the places which lie ahead on the trek north. Three and a half hours after leaving Adelaide and several stops later, the rail yards of Port Pirie, where we'll change to the standard gauge train. A few carriages belonging to other famous trains, including the Indian Pacific, sit idly against a drab industrial background. The changeover is a second nature affair and will be completed quickly. The conductors and waiters look incongruous in their bow ties, but immediately create a mood of yesteryear which will infect everyone over the next two days. The further north you travel, the more ganified you become. Lunch is always the first step of the second leg out of Port Piri. Hope you enjoy your lunch. Thank you. It's after leaving Port Augusta at the tip of Spencer Gulf in South Australia that the trip starts to really change complexion. These days, the departure doesn't even ruffle the locals' feathers. But a century ago, the building of the first line was bread and butter to most people in the area and part of a South Australian dream to annex the Northern Territory and build a railroad from the Southern Ocean to the Arafura Sea, thus bisecting and controlling the entire central region of Australia. Despite several attempts at working North-South simultaneously, it remained the dream of an ill-advised and inept government. Then in 1878, 
16 years after the first statutes were prepared, the narrow gauge line headed towards the Flinders Ranges and Pitchy Ritchie Pass. Unlike this line, which was used from 1956 to overcome the inadequacies of the narrow gauge. This stretch of line that I'm walking across here is the old line that runs into Port Augusta about 25 miles southwest of here. It's in the middle of Pitchy Ritchie Pass and it's here that the Pitchy Ritchie Preservation Society is keeping the line and some of the old carriages and locomotives intact, that is the original steam engines. But that's not all they're looking after. They're preserving too this beautiful stonework that exists all the way through these hills. Each stone was placed by hand meticulously and there's no cement, no mortar used at all. Ostensibly, the railway was built as a service to people pioneering the area, but many argued it was through the political pressure of certain prominent pastoralists that it took the back-breaking route through the ranges and within a stone's throw of certain properties. The first stretch of track was opened a year and a half after work started. It covered the 40 kilometres to the town of Quorn, which prospered as a result. A year later, it had reached Hawker, then a year after that, in 1881, was through to the centre known as Beltana. Today Beltana is all but forgotten. The railway station is a shop for tourists and the trappings of its former status, like the town's name on the station wall, are barely discernible. The old freight shed stands idle, a far cry from its heyday. In those days, a century ago, the town was the base for development of the line. A thousand construction navvies invaded it, offering profits on one hand, but violence on the other. Settlers in Beltana, fearing such violence, had demanded that a police station and lock-up be built. It wasn't long before it was in constant use, because the hotels in the town were well patronised. Drunkenness, disturbing the peace and rowdyism were commonplace. The townsfolk were also worried by large-scale desertions from gangs of men who simply walked off the job. Some disappeared, others returned after a few days, and many, probably trying to make their way south again, lurked in the bush outside Beltana and raided stores and homes for food and money. Violence and intimidation weren't enough for the settlers. Death from sickness and accident seemed to be prevalent. But Beltana represented the era in which there were massacres of whites by blacks and vice versa. Afghan camel drivers succumbing to the harsh desert environment. Navvies who died or were killed near the railway line. Death was often the price to pay in developing the outback. Not only with the railway, but earlier with the Overland Telegraph. For much of the time it was nothing more than a torturous slog. Cuttings like this one were dug by hand. Concrete for bridges and culverts was mixed by hand on boards. Extra ballast in the form of stones was collected by Afghan workers and left in piles for the navvies to collect later. How futile it would all seem to those men now that the rails have long since been removed and the few reminders left to rot in the searing heat. How many navvies must have pondered the sense of battling the Flinders Rangers as they laboured here to give the train a free run back down to the plains where the line is today and where it probably should have been built then. From here the history of Beltana and the original line is well hidden by the Rangers so that it passes unnoticed in the late afternoon routine on the standard gauge GAN. That's quarter past six for... Uh, quarter past six dinner. What about breakfast? Uh, that'll be uh, half past seven, roughly quarter past eight. Hold on to these because if we lose them, you don't get any dinner.
from there we were going to the Far East and going on to Mosquitoes to do the same work. And right in the middle of it, the war stopped. Well, actually not in the middle of it. The war stopped on the night of our last, of our last uh, operational exercise. The train is flanked by the Flinders Rangers most of the way from Port Augusta to Maree. There are few towns of any size, but the line is lightly strewn with the stark huts of Fettler's camps, built to house the men who service the standard gauge railway. They alternate and contrast with remnants of the original narrow gauge line, now running parallel for much of the journey. It's now a straightforward run with the possibility of a stop for a coal train from Lee Creek as the only likely diversion. Otherwise, it's full steam ahead. It's at this first sitting of dinner you get to know the people you'll be sharing your meals with until Alice Springs. We wanted to see Alice Springs. Um, we want to see the camels. Here, there's camels up there. There's native Aborigines. So we want to go up there. don't want to too much about camels. They give me the hump. <laughs> <laughs> I've still been retired five years, and I, it's something I've got to do. You must go on the gap. So if you don't do it this year, you'll never do it. The longer the evening shadows become, the more the microcosm within the carriages is established, and the more the passengers relax. The changeover at Maria is about four hours away, and with it, the luxury of a sleeping berth on what the old timers regard as the real GAN, with its three foot six inch narrow gauge track. Shortly before midnight we come to the end of the second leg and the terminus for the standard gauge train. It will wait here several days until the return journey. For a train so famous as the GAN, a midnight rendezvous seems a rather inglorious way to make its acquaintance. In the hot and gloomy moonlight of Marie, you wonder if this is the real GAN. Why doesn't something say so? No lights, no names, just the old carriages sitting, waiting. The platform soon empties, except for the kitchen crew intent on transferring food and lots of drink for the remaining 870 kilometres to Alice Springs. Somehow it almost seems clandestine, as though they shouldn't be doing it and as though we shouldn't be there. Marie is one of the hottest spots in Australia. 
For years it was the base of all camel trains which preceded the GAN north, so it's appropriate that it's home and stable for the real GAN, although in the dusk it looks anything but the changeover point it becomes after dark each week. With camel strings regarded as perfect for use in opening up the outback, camel breeding farms were operated around Maori until finally usurped by the GAN itself. Well, the GAN was a bit faster than the old camels, that's about all, but uh, there's nothing that you couldn't bring along that I can't put on a camel. And did you used to do many trips on the camels? Oh yes, I was up in Aminka, Birdsville, all up that country, a couple of trips to Alice Springs before the railway line. What sort of things did you have to remember with camels? That... Well, you don't have to remember that much. Once you get going with camels, everything sort of comes to you. You know what you've got to do. And uh, you slow them up in the morning. You do your 25 or 30 mile a day. Then you offload them at night, hobble them, take the saddles off, water them if you've got water handy, and let them go. And in the morning you chase them again, bring them back again. The Afghan camel drivers and their families formed half of the population of Maree, when the camels travelled all regions north and east from the township. They developed the town as their religious centre. Mosques were built, although no reminders of these remain in the town today. The going of the GAN should have little effect on Maree and its current population of 300. Some rail workers, such as cleaners on the GAN itself, will leave. But it will continue to be the rail centre for cattle sent down the Birdsville track, which itself terminates in Mari. Not only that, it will also remain the top end of the standard gauge line serving the Lee Creek coalfield. The changeover at Mari in the stealth of night sets the mood. What to expect beyond the darkness of the desert in view of stories about the GAN and the battering it's taken over the years from derailments and flash floods. A mechanic makes last minute repairs to the undercarriage of car three, giving strength to the various legends. We have a rusted train type here and uh, we've had to replace it and we've also had to re-thread the, uh, the other piece which joins it of course. That happened in the derailment, did it? Yeah, it happened as a result of the derailment up the Warren or up the road there. Uh, very bad? Yeah, pretty bad. Four coaches, they were with a problem, they're heavy of course. When the GAN finally moves off, it's with respect for its age and the condition of the track. The creaking of joints is followed by a slow roll, something akin to being on a ship in medium to heavy swell. Time is becoming meaningless. Passengers are allotted either single or twin berths. Neither exactly screams out with spaciousness, and the single feels as though it could double as a broom closet. Yet sleeping isn't hard. Once you accept the limitations of a bunk precisely body length and body width in dimension, the easy rhythm of the train does the rest. The GAN emerges at dawn like a caterpillar on a tightrope. Lake Eyre and the lowest lying land in Australia have passed somewhere to the east and behind us. As suddenly as it went to sleep, the train is awake. Faces which were vaguely familiar from as far back as Adelaide pop up again. With every encounter, the waiters are becoming far less formal, but there's a feeling they could play the serving scenario without a second thought. Rice fruit. Gentlemen. Uh, rice bubbles, thank you. Rice bubbles. Fruit. Yeah, whatever those. A couple of fruit, rolled oats, cornflakes, all yeah. fine, rice bubbles. That's right. Eggs, bacon, pork, sausage, right. and eggs. What about toast, water, scrambled eggs? Toast, marmalade, tea, coffee, and cocoa. Does anyone want a beer? The spirit of camaraderie between passengers and crew has persisted throughout the GAN's history. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have the uh, Channel 7 youth crew on the GAN. Maybe ever since 1883, when the powder magazine on one of the trains blew up. Fast action by the crew then saved the passengers, who, in gratitude, immediately took up a collection for the driver, guard and others, with the sounds of the explosion still ringing in their ears. When you're ready, Jack. 
Breakfast and William Creek usually arrive simultaneously if there have been no problems. It's literally a one hotel town. The GAN rarely stops more than 10 minutes at places like William Creek. Just enough to say hello, hand over the mail and supplies and leave again. takes on water. You may leave the train for a few minutes while we're watering the cars, but don't wander too far away from the train. Despite the warning and intense heat, passengers seem compelled to wander. Whether it's because it's the first opportunity to move from the train since Mari, or a chance to soak up the remoteness, it's hard to say. But there's no doubt that some are trying to imagine what Edwards Creek was like around the turn of the century and before. Of course, in those days, the train used to empty at every stop where there was a pub, and apparently there were plenty of those. What the passengers would do is go inside, have a beer, and when they heard the whistle from the engine, they'd straggle back in their own good time. Nothing seems to have changed today much because uh, at Edwards Creek here the people still get up but all they have is the desert. Still Edwards Creek is pretty special because it's where the old lo locomotives, the puffing billy style, used to stop on their way to Alice to water up. And that's another similarity today, they still water up here and the conductors and their bow ties still get out in the hot desert sun. If one thing is common to the old GAN trips and those of today, it's the need to take on water in an uncompromising desert. The freshwater spring here made Edwards Creek an ideal location for a fetless camp and locomotive depot, a role it enjoyed during the 1930s. Unlike many of the older centres, remnants of those days, like the locomotive sheds, can be found by the line. Sheds for the fetless trolleys, or quads as they're known today, sit across the line from ruins of the cottages which were home for the workers in Edwards Creek 90 years ago. It was in this inhospitable environment that they serviced the narrow gauge route of the GAN for miles in either direction, even fighting the odd plague of grasshoppers and ants which infested the tracks. It's not hard to see why GAN country has always been regarded as the land of plenty of time and wait a bit. It's certainly so today, even without the irritations and delays they faced in the days of steam. It'll take the locomotive a good kilometre or two to get the train wound up. And even then, the fastest we'll travel is only 40 kilometres an hour, the maximum allowed on the old track. There's almost an urge to get out and run past it at times when the slow roll becomes most noticeable. Years of practice walking the GAN's corridors have given Chief Conductor Ambrose Aspro Lyons a distinct gait. With legs apart and set to overcome the rolling motion, Spro can get down the corridors faster than most. Not that he often needs to. Morning, did you have a nice sleep? In this never never land, Aspro has a how you going relationship with everyone, passengers and crew. Morning, some of whom claim he's almost as famous as the train itself. And so he should be after working on it more than 35 years. In the old days, the uh, non-air conditioned days, it was, uh, uh, you know, the, the people used to mix around freely and uh, you be, used to bring all the Territorians down every Christmas and uh, they'd bring their dogs and their cats and yeah. all the pets. And, uh, but nowadays they mostly fly. Uh, but in them days, we used to know nearly everyone on the train. Everyone sort of knew you one another. But it's still like that today, don't you think? Oh yes, it's, it's just, but you don't get so many of the Territorians out there. Passengers may have changed over the years, but the compartments haven't. Their craftsmanship is outstanding without belying their age. Oh, I'll be 50 years old. Used to be on the old uh, trains in the non-air conditioned days. Two taps, hot, cold. And then you just fold it away? Yeah. And close it? Yeah. 
And this is drinking water? These, uh, that's ice water, yeah. And how easy is it to make your bed up when you want to go to bed, if you... Oh, well, they, they just pull down, there's no, they, they're made up in the morning, and then they just pull them down like this, and that's it. That's it. Throw the pillow on. Like its predecessors, the camels, perhaps the Gan too could be called the ship of the desert. For the comparison with the ship is an accurate one. From the style of service to the rotating change of shifts with the crew. The consistent drumming of the engine, the games being played, the friendship. It even moves at a similar speed. Only the promenade deck and ocean are missing. And while there's no captain as such, the drivers are separated from the passengers and other crew whose destiny they control. That isolation makes them self-sufficient as well as watchful. Once you learn the track, you know, you, you know it, but at night you've got to concentrate, especially if you get a bit weary, you know, a bit tired towards early hours of the morning. What would you rather drive, the old GAN or something nice and new? Well, I think you've got to look for progress, don't you? I think uh, the new line's on its way. It's... But you might miss the GAN a bit. Oh, I think so. I think all the uh, old original drivers will uh, be sorry to see it go. Although its departure from this route is inevitable, parts of the train, in particular the locomotives like this NJ3 series, will be put to tender. The chances are they'll have many more runs left in either Queensland or Tasmania where narrow gauge railways will remain in service. But when the GAN does go, not only memories of the train itself will be left. Most drivers admit they'll also miss the view as they pass through this cutting, for immediately ahead lies one of the highlights of the trip. The Nils River, spanned by the Algae Buckner Bridge, a bridge over the oasis no one quite expects to find in the middle of this desert. From the approach to the bridge, cameras click more than at any other stage of the journey, and even crew members never tire of the contrast they see here. One railwayman so loved the crossing that his ashes were scattered from a train passing over it. Rumours insist the bridge was originally built to span the River Murray at Murray Bridge, but was found to be too short and then hauled up here to give the GAN a dignified crossing of the Niels River. Like much of the line, it wasn't without its tragedies either. Two fettlers fell from the span during its construction and died. This is Mount Dutton, a few kilometres north of the Algie Buckner Bridge. Watching from the comfort of an air-conditioned carriage, it all seems a little unreal. To think that over 90 years ago, construction navvies toiled and sweated with their teams of camels to build this line. Yet the heat and isolation out here phases most passengers, even in 1980. Outside the train, temperatures can rise as high as 50 degrees Celsius. The drivers change every seven hours. It's an unhurried affair with not too much ceremony. While the relieving crew is up front, the others will rest in the crew's quarters at the rear of the train as it rolls on to Udnadatta through the desert sands of mid-north South Australia. It's mid-afternoon on the second day when the train pulls in at Udnadatta. For the best part of 40 years, this was the end of the line while a series of bureaucratic blunders delayed further construction. Today, it's no more than a whistle stop. Not too many years ago in Udnadatta, the name derived from an Aboriginal word meaning blossom of the mulga, most passengers would have emptied into the pub. No more. These days, the blossom of the mulga has been replaced by the glass of the broken beer bottle. Here's the order. Oh, yeah. The order for Alice Springs. You won't forget that? No. Okay. I dropped getting through last week. Yeah? And that's the only way I get it through is the telecoms. Yeah. Bit of weather coming up. But it wouldn't rain. About 10 inches. Perhaps Udna, as it's affectionately called, will be affected more than any other centre on the line by the departure of the GAN. For so many years, it's been a lifeline for the cattle industry in the area. The town is roughly the same dimensions as in its halcyon days after the Second World War, but easy to drive around in five minutes. Like Mari, Udna had a thriving camel train base for about 400 camels. But apart from descendants who live here, now has little tangible evidence of the Afghan camp or the palm-surrounded mosque, which existed on the western settlement. There's already a sense of the forgotten about the place. Yet the ultra-modern school and other government offices look thoroughly out of step with the rest of the town, suggesting there is confidence in its future. This is a pastoral area, and uh, the cattle production will be still the same, 
and the people that uh, are connected with the cattle production, stockmen, native or white or station owners, they still will be here. The school will be here and, uh, you know, government offices will be here and also, uh, well, the rail goes, but uh, the transport still go on. Eddie Pekinek regards Udna as his town. Because he owns much of it, he has reason to ooze confidence. But there are others, not nearly as optimistic, who feel that without the train, Udna Data will become yet another of the ghost towns spat out by the GAN and given back to the desert. The second and final night on the GAN is well underway. There are no strangers anymore, and after dinner, most passengers dwell, for a short time at least, in the lounge car. The German designers originally designated the three sections of the car for music, smoking, and ladies. Yet apart from the piano being in the centre section, any divisions these days are imagined, because passengers are always on the move, joining in wherever they can and adding to the gregarious spirit. Well, if you're hanging out in Adelaide looking for a lift to get you off the track to Ella Springs, you can forget about a plane, they only go too fast. The only way to go is the one that gets there last. Now I'm talking about a train and I'm talking about a track that runs from here to Ella Springs and sometimes gets you back. Now I want it ain't no speed and it's not to flash your fine. It'll always take you some time a little bit further up the line. On the gas, if you wanna see the land by the gas, oh, it's a magic river, right? It's a wonder it ever makes it back again. On the gas, if you wanna see the land by the gas, oh, it's a magic river, right? So wonder if it makes it back again. On again. If you wanna see the land ride again. Probably none of the late night revelers were aware of it, but it was about here on the line that they were singing their praises to the GAN during a watering stop just over the border in the Northern Territory. There are a few tears being spilt over the closure of the line at Fink, a settlement for the Apertula Aboriginal community. Their lifestyle is relaxed and relatively easy going already, but they see it becoming more close-knit as an all-black town once the GAN leaves Fink. People here point to friction between white itinerant workers and black residents and hope that closure of the line will reduce the number of white visitors. The catch-22 is that it may severely affect business at the hotel, which is run by the Apertula community and provides a solid base of income for them. So it's more likely to be some time after the closure of the line that the real effect is felt in the town. Of course, the closure means there'll be no more enforced stopovers in Fink as they wait for floodwaters to subside further up the line at the river. It's hard to believe this could be the main line north to Alice Springs, and it's no wonder that line inspectors regard the top end of the track as not a day-by-day -day proposition, but hour-by-hour. Hour. This is the riverbed of the Fink. And it's here that the GAN currently passes through in the mid of night. The current schedule is a bit of a shame because it doesn't allow people to see the beauty of the Fink River itself, which is broad and filled with gum trees. The Fink's probably one of the most famous parts of the old line because it was just about the most flood prone and at the moment one of the most fly prone. 
but they first started in the 1930s with a bridge which went across here. That was washed away. Then they replaced it with an aqueduct. That was washed away. So finally, in frustration, they laid this old line clean along on the bottom of the riverbed itself. And if you look closely, you can see the old sleepers are well and truly parched and rotten and broken. They won't last long, and if another flood comes through here, neither will the line. The gam won't be going, it will have gone. Visible evidence of man's efforts to overcome the flooding tantrums of the Fink River abound, and much more is buried under decades of river silt. No one's even bothered to remove a previous track which led over the causeway. Over the years, the strategy has remained simple. When the line is washed away, replace it. Yet outback rivers, like the Fink, can turn into raging torrents very quickly, although with the sun shining and the river dry, there's virtually no indication of that. The open stretches here don't even look like a river, so you accept rather easily the decision by the original surveyors to lay the track in other regions direct onto what they presumed was simply parched desert ground. The thought of flooding must have been their last consideration. Yet in 1968, the Fink flooded four times in one season. It's capable of depths over five metres, but can go for 15 and many more years without any water at all. On occasions when the river was in flood like that, the crew would test the waters by either walking across, probing with a stick, or by climbing into a fettler's trolley and measuring the depth as they went. If the water was two feet or less deep, it meant the locomotive could cope because the boilers were above that level. So unless the lines had been washed away, the train could proceed within a reasonable time of the flood passing. Not so with the diesel engines. They can only handle three inches of water over the track, so it's been common for train loads of passengers to remain stranded in the outback for days and weeks on end. Although in recent years, passengers stranded on the GAN have been airlifted out by helicopter. On one occasion, the GAN drew into the Alice Springs railway station at the appointed time in the morning. It just happened that it was three months late. The flood-prone nature of the route taken by the original railway is the major reason for its demise and replacement by the new standard gauge line further west. At this point on the journey, it's about 90 kilometres away from the old line, with the railhead only 160 kilometres south of Alice Springs. The latest technology is being used and it takes a while to get used to the space-age sounds which are commonplace on a line welded together in massive lengths. It's the sort of sound which will replace the familiar clickety-clack on the old-style bolted track. This is one of the many contrasts between the two lines. These days a gang of only 55 men is needed, and only two or three of those are at the railhead, a little different from the building of the original line. Still, some things haven't changed. The sledgehammers have held their place. It's only the sound they make that's different. The new line has been lucky. In the remoteness of the desert, it's remained free of governments, unions and protest groups. So it's within budget and a year ahead of schedule. It could be in Alice Springs even before October this year, if senior roadmaster Eddie Osiris can maintain his enviable record of more than five kilometres a week since he took the job which few people covered. So what motivated you personally to come out here? Um, it was money more than anything else. And plus, uh, uh, plus it was uh, a challenge to me, uh, as far as that goes. Uh, to live here, um, I like to quote that I am uh, more or less 
I'm lonely in the city, in a marketplace, and yet out here I've got that much uh, wildlife and whatever, you know, that uh, I don't feel lonely at all. At last, after more than 1,500 kilometres and two days, six hours of travel, the GAN is in sight of Heavy Tree Gap, the gateway to Alice Springs. The railway line fades into the sand, a stark contrast to the sealed bitumen road, the first we've seen since Port Augusta, more than 1,200 kilometres south of the Alice. Scheduled time of arrival was 7 a.m. The actual arrival time was 1.30 p.m. For the GAN, that's somewhere between average and good. <laughs> Have a good trip. Thank you. Fifty years married, this lady. Yes, go to the wedding, married. thank you. Thank you, boys, you made it lovely. Cheerio, boys, thank you. Mind the step, yes, Thank you. Have a good time. Okay, you, too. Bye -bye. you don't want a hand with those things to all there? Oh, no, that's great. We're going to be carrying them for a while. So we're going to all right. Start now. See ya. Okay, bye. Bye, bye. Well, I got a map of Alice Springs. Here we are. <laughs> And now they are here, not even the passengers seem to care that another trip of the GAN has ended. Perhaps it's because on the GAN, to journey is better than to arrive. There were times on the GAN coming north when it seemed hard to believe man had actually conquered flight, let alone invented and developed the passenger jet. A handful of enthusiasts who like to perpetuate that time warp can be found on most trips of the GAN. They simply spend a few hours in Alice Springs before boarding the train again for its journey back into the desert that same night. However, most, having spent a week or two in and about the Alice, will leave by plane for the sake of expediency and a complete contrast. The captain's first announcement has special significance for the Ganites aboard. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Captain Fuller and supply information for you. We're now 120 miles out of Alice Springs and crossing over the Big River. This is where flash flooding sometimes causes delay to the uh, GAN train which operates in the Alice through to Adelaide. The GAN would take about eight hours to wend its way back to the Fink River. We've been flying less than 20 minutes and in an hour and a half we'll have landed at Adelaide Airport. Roughly two days, four hours and 20 minutes faster than the GAN has averaged the trip from Alice Springs for the last 51 years. When the new train takes over in October, it will be called the GAN officially. Timetables and tourist brochures will see to that. But this GAN has already survived the coming of the diesel electric locomotive and a change to standard gauge as far as Maree in 1954. Whether it can survive the complete transformation to new rolling stock, powerful new locomotives, high speed travel, plus a jump across 150 kilometres of desert to the new line, remains to be seen.
But even if the name does linger, the idiosyncrasies will disappear. And it was those which drew people to the Gan, making it better to journey than to arrive. If you want to see the land, ride the Gan. Oh, it's the magic, the magic boomerang. It's a wonder it ever makes it back again. On the Gan. If you want to see the land, ride the Gan. Oh, it's a magic boomerang. It's a wonder it ever makes it back again. On the Gan. If you want to see the land, ride the Gan. Oh, it's a magic boomerang. It's a wonder it ever makes it back again. <laughs> 